For our next session, I would like to welcome Brian Exelbeard, who will speak to us about what Red Hat wants out of its investment in the CentOS project. Thank you, Bex. Thank you. Let's see if screens work. I got all of this set up like magic here. Woohoo! All right. Uh, just a little bit of hygiene, I'll say at the beginning. I know Rich is here and he'll jump in if I miss something critical, but uh, trying to watch the chat and present and have a two-year-old does not lead to coherent speech. So I am only going to look at the Q&A tab uh, while I'm talking. And I'd like you to land your questions there because that lets me kind of know what you're thinking and helps me read the room. Um, but it's also a great place for us to organize, you know, what questions we're going to have. And this is a talk that will be extraordinarily short if there's no questions because, and I'll get to why, but your questions and comments are actually what's going to drive a larger part of the conversation here. So after the hygiene, we'll do a little bit of disclaimer. I work for Red Hat, but this talk, it doesn't represent all of Red Hat. There's a lot of different views at Red Hat. So this is specifically focused on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux business units view with occasional shading from other partners of ours in the organization. And so specifically, I wanna call out that I'm not trying to represent, for example, the open source program office's view. Um, I'm not trying to represent all of our employees' views. Our employees are given lots of freedom to participate in open source under their terms, and so I'm not gonna to pretend to represent all of that either. Um, Red Hat is not a hive mind. It is not monolithic. All of those things are by design. And so keep that in mind that this is a very specific perspective. Um, and uh, this is also only based on public information. So there's nothing super secret here. I am sorry. So let's start with the RHEL BU, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux Business Unit. Um, I think we actually have a, a slightly different name, but I always think of it as the RHEL BU. And uh, I mentioned it already. So what is it and what is their viewpoint and why does it matter? So the RHEL BU is responsible for, for lack of a better way of putting it, the business of RHEL. Um, we define the product and we define its business terms. Um, so when I say we define the product, there's a process uh, we use, um, I'll get into that, but there's a process by which you can define how the product should work. And um, you should define what it should look like, how you're going to offer it into the marketplace, you know, what you're going to say about it in a marketplace down to, you know, like what you might charge for it. If it's a product that has a charge associated with it. So the RELB is responsible for that. We don't do the engineering. Um, we don't do a lot of the other pieces behind RELB. We don't provide the support, any of those things. We define the product and the business guidelines. Um, interestingly, uh, if you didn't know this, the RELBU also doesn't sell it. There's another organization inside of Red Hat that actually goes out and does the field work to do sales or the partner management work. Um, the other thing the RELBU does is we work with our partners in Red Hat. And for the most part, our partners are people like the engineering as a concept, as a department, that team. Um, or it could be other BUs that have other products out there. And normally that's where the story would end. But we reorganized a couple months ago because Musical Chairs is amazing. Um, and this Musical Chairs game resulted in everybody winding up in a chair with a cake under it. It actually was a fantastic reorganization. And what it did is it put together something called the Platforms Business Group. And it brought together all of your, your, your favorites, like a super group of Red Hat. So you've got like OpenShift and OpenStack and all these folks are sitting in a room. It's amazing. And the reason that this is amazing is, and the reason this affects what does Red Hat want, is we now have all of these BUs organized in a specific group that's kind of all going in the same direction. This has brought the opportunity for us to have a closer relationship. Um, and, and by that, I mean, the story always is like this, like RHEL is the platform upon which many Red Hat products ship. But previously, if we wanted to work together, it was kind of like one of those old around the world in 80 days movies. We would get our best negotiators, we would hire translators, we would charter a steamship, we would go to a neutral island, we would try not to negotiate away the home world. And that didn't always bring success. And so by putting us in this platform's business group, we're all kind of sitting at the same dinner table. So we're having a greater relationship. And because we have a focus now as a group, not just at the product level, um, we have greater opportunities for synergy and opportunities to work together. You, you can't give these kinds of presentations without saying synergy once. Um, it also creates an interesting dynamic because, as an example, there are products inside of Red Hat that have, you know, they have a specific release cadence, right? 
And so they'll come to RHEL and they'll be like, so we need EUS on this specific release. And RHEL will be like, yeah, we, we weren't planning to do that. And they're like, yeah, but we need EUS on this release. Well, we weren't planning to do that. Um, and so it would be kind of a, our vice presidents will talk to your vice presidents in meetings and things like this. Now we're all at the same dinner table. Um, and so we can look up to the front of the table and we can ask mom, hey, what do we do here? And that creates two dynamics. The first is it gives us a way to like resolve these things in a, in a better fashion. The second is it creates the dynamic of we really want to work together because we all know that when you appeal to higher authority and you ask mom, you rarely get an answer that is satisfactory to everybody. So it really gives you that incentive to, to kind of think things through in this direction. And I, I'm really excited that we, we've rolled up under this structure. So I, who am I? Well, I'm Brian Exelbeard. Everybody calls me Bex, except for my sister. Sometimes I don't answer her when she does that. So she screams Brian really loudly. You are all free to scream Brian really loudly. Um, I am the community business owner uh, in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux business unit. As I said, I sit in product management. Um, for those of you who play titling games in corporate America or in corporate world, I guess it is, I'm a product marketing manager. And for those of you who actually work in product marketing managing, management, I apologize because I'm not actually a product marketing manager and I do not do the job that you all do, which you do amazingly well. Well, we just needed another form of PM and apparently HR came to us and said, you cannot overload the ones you're already overloading. Pick a new one to overload. So they picked this one. So I said I'm the community business owner. What does that mean? Well, community business and owner do not work, look like words that sanely belong together. So let's kind of tear that apart. Back in 2019, the REL business unit decided to reorganize itself and adopt um, some ideas based on a framework that the Pragmatic Institute advocates for. And the gist of it is that Pragmatic talks about how to launch a product and bring a product to market and be successful. And there's a couple of axes in there. It's great training if you've had the opportunity to take it. If this interests you, it's good training. I don't work for them. You know, do with that as you wish. But the gist of the idea is that you come up with, you know, what you think the problems in the market are, and then you define which one of those you want to do, and you do them, and then there's processes for launching a product and setting price and, and all of those pieces. So inside of the REL BU, we created this business owner role to be someone who thinks about a particular market segment or class of people or group of customers that you can somehow define. So it might be, say, telco as a vertical, like all the telecoms all over the world. Um, or it might be something that's more horizontal, like mid-market, which is an amazing term because you get to literally make up what you think it means, and you're probably right. But say mid-market for a random company might be, I don't know, 500 employees or less. Okay, fine, whatever. That defines a, a cadre of people. And the community business owner sits and thinks about what that segment wants, and they go out and talk to folks in that segment, and interview and survey. And we, we try to come up with the problems that that category of customers is facing, that category of people is facing. And we write what are called market problems. Now, this is kind of like what business development people do. And in fact, there's an interesting debate going on right now about whether business owners should be renamed to business developers because titling is hard. That's the naming things is hard side of business. Um, but where I really wanted to go with this was that we realized in 2019 that the RELBU didn't have a way to think about and relate to RHEL's ancestors, the community. Um, and so we created a community business owner, and that's where this role comes from. The business and business owner is just that segment. In this case, it's defined by the, the adjective in front of it, the community segment. And then the owner part is just that you, you're responsible for it. And I think a key thing to point out here is a business segment doesn't have to be revenue generating because the community is not a revenue generating segment, but it's an extremely important segment to REL um, and to Red Hat overall. And so we have somebody, me, in place to think about things. And I do this by writing things called market problems that are used internally. And they explain a challenge that's being faced in, in this case in the community. And then they explain why Red Hat should solve that challenge, why we should step up to the plate on that. Um, and by Red Hat in this sentence, I really mean the RELBU should solve this problem. Um, and at that point, 
those are reviewed by product management teams. They figure out what that's going to mean with regards to offerings or experiences or how do you how does it look when it's done? And and that eventually gets handed off to product owners who sit in our engineering organization and they help turn these things into features, which then or no epics, I think it is, which then become features, which ultimately become lines of code, which become merge requests and the magic happens and then the thing is delivered and we're all excited and we launch t-shirts out of a cannon or something. Um, but the idea here is my my area of focus is to think about that. So, so what do I do every day? So from the project's perspective, a lot of my work is to share information and connect people. Um, I might connect product managers with specific engineers or community members. I might connect other members of the community to each other uh, in some cases, all of those pieces. But this distills down into one of my key role responsibilities from the project's perspective. And that is that I represent Red Hat on the CentOS board. And uh, if you've ever attended any of the board meetings or if you attended the AMA right before this, you'll notice I tend to be pretty quiet. And this is because I'm the only board member who doesn't represent themselves. So if I speak, I am speaking as Red Hat. I don't do it in a funny voice, I am sorry. But I do speak as Red Hat. So my personal opinion is not what I am presenting. And so I tend to not offer any commentary unless Red Hat has an opinion about the thing that is under consideration. Um, and so that kind of drives back into this, what does Red Hat want concept? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that. I, to continue this day to day a bit, just because I think it's helpful for you to see the context here. I take the things that I'm learning from all of these interactions. For example, what are the challenges the CentOS project has? And I turn some of those challenges into market problems. And I try to advocate for Red Hat to step up to the plate and solve them. But another key thing that I do is I guide some of the folks who are representing those challenges to me to other groups and places. And at a minimum, I try to give them an unblocking no. Um, you know, the saying in open source, no is temporary, yes is forever. Um, so if everybody in the room goes, hey, we have this problem, and then they all look at me as the rel business unit and go, we think maybe you should, you know, do a thing. And I go not and say nothing, then they're blocked. But if I go, it's a real problem. I understand your problem. The context makes sense. The rel BU is not interested in doing that. If I give them an unblocking no, then they go, okay, well, where else can we go shop where you know people are interested? Should we, you know, build a SIG? Should we go talk to the open source program office? Should we do whatever? But like we know that the rel BU is at least that one part of Red Hat is, is not going to do it. So an unblocking no is an important part of my job. Um, I also work with Rich Bowen and others like him to coordinate responses to the community so that when the community asks questions about what they can, need, want to do, we can unblock them to can, need, and want those things. Um, something, though, that I don't do is I don't really think about RHEL. Um, I don't think about RHEL features by extension. I don't really think about CentOS stream merge requests. I rarely know what version of software is shipping. Um, I'm embarrassed to say when I do these presentations and I have to use version numbers as an example, I rarely get them right because my area of focus is somewhere else. My area of focus is, is here on the community. I love this diagram. This diagram shows from a code perspective um, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux or just the Enterprise Linux ecosystem. If you start on the left, you've got all of the open source projects that are out there, you know, whether it's Ben Utils or the Linux kernel or Python mail merge, they're all out there. And then you see this blue where Fedora Linux, this is the second uh, block, has coalesced most of that stuff into a functioning operating system. They have they've integrated it. They've started to put the pieces together. They've made it a usable thing. Um, that then becomes CentOS Stream. That's the orange or the third block here. That becomes RHEL. My area of focus is on how all of this big picture, this galactic pinball, if you will, kind of fits together. Galactic pools, maybe a better example. How this fits together. Um, I think about that straight line that you can envision from the left side of this page to the right side of this page. Um, that, that critical path of RHEL development. I think about the person who's coming up to this ecosystem and they've got something they want to do. And I hope that it's super crystal clear where they need to go. They have freedom to go do anything they want to do. 
But ideally, they should be able to walk up and go, aha, this is where I need to go. It's going to be the best option for me. Um, and so I think a lot about this ecosystem piece and how all of this comes together. And as a consequence, I think about the communities that are behind these pieces of code, because these pieces of code don't exist without people. Sure, we could write CI systems and, you know, take the thousand monkeys theory and bang on typewriters and hope one day a rel falls out. But reality is all of this functions because of these communities. And these communities are not isolated. For example, if Neil Gomp is listening to this talk right now, he's all over this diagram. Um, and I, I pick on Neil, he's a friend. Um, but that's something else that I think about, like how do all of these pieces come together? And I work with my partners, but I do all of this from that RHEL BU lens. And so that drives the question, what does Red Hat want? Well, it's hard to answer. So let's start with some non-answers. Red Hat does not want everything an employee happens to propose in a con or contribute to a project. Because we, and I alluded to this earlier, we give our employees a lot of freedom at Red Hat. You can actually go read this online. We have published these, these guidelines. And basically our employees have the right to go do things in open source, whether it's things that scratch their own itch, things they think that, that project needs, or things that will help Red Hat accomplish the goals that it has. And so, you don't necessarily know when I show up and I propose a change, whether that's a BU goal or objective, whether it's just I thought that needed to happen, or if my laptop is down and this is the fix that's going to get it back up. So you can't really look at that. We also don't tend to like have an explicit list of goals that we publish somewhere. Um, for public information reasons, we don't tend to talk about things till we're ready to talk about them. So like we're not going to talk about the next release of RHEL and what's going to be in it and what our goals for it are until we're ready to begin that process of talking about the next release of RHEL. There's no early advanced copy. So that's not what Red Hat wants. How do we figure out what Red Hat wants and how does that play out? And I promise you I've got some specifics at the end here. And again, please put Q&A in the Q&A tab because uh, it'll help keep me from rambling too much. So let's talk about CentOS Stream. Why is it here and how is it an example of what Red Hat wants? Well, CentOS Stream from Red Hat's perspective, and I'm, I'm thinking about the RHEL-BU, but I think my friends in engineering might agree with me here. Um, but don't hold my feet to that, you know, or don't hold them to that, I should say. You should, you should go and talk to them. Um, CentOS Stream solves a couple of very specific problems. It provides a path to influence future RHEL minor releases. And this is a very specific problem that the RHEL BU identified as something that we wanted to have solved. Now let's talk about a few keywords here. Um, influence. Influence is providing suggestions or trying to guide. That means you can talk, we'll listen, but we may not do what you have said. We may not take your advice. Um, and a RHEL minor release, just for full clarity, um, I suspect everybody knows this, but it's the Y in X.Y. So if you think about RHEL 8.5, um, that's a minor release. The five is the, the minor release. Now, everybody gets all hung up at this point and goes, well, what about non.o? Well, dot o is technically a minor release, but for most of us, because it's zero, it feels special. And because it's the first nine, it feels special and big GA and t-shirt cannons and all that. Um, the other thing that's, I think, interesting about uh, dot o is uh, it is the, the most of the influence that you would have over that has actually already happened in the Fedora project. So if, if you were showing up today to try and make great influence on RHEL 9.0, you may be a little late depending on what your goal is. You should go talk to our friends in the Fedora project, take a look at ELN, they've got some cool stuff over there. Um, so CentOS Stream provides this path to influence future minor releases by having a contribution system in place on top of the RHEL source. And I am speaking conceptually. I'm not going to talk about Git branches or supply chains or mirroring or build systems or any of those myriad of things. My daughter has just gotten home. So if you hear a woo from Peppa Pig, we know why. Um, those contributions, and this kind of gets back into that, that BU thinking about what CentOS Stream solves as a problem. Those contributions, they can come from anyone and they're reviewed just like in any open source contribution project. Uh, they get feedback from other contributors, conversation with maintainers, people show up and have their influence. 
the ultimate decision on whether a contribution is taken falls to that maintainer. Um, key thing with CentOS Stream, and I am talking about the CentOS Stream code, not things that are in CentOS SIGs, um, is that all the maintainers work for Red Hat. They're engineers in the relevant rel SSTs, which also brings back an interesting well be you what does Red Hat want perspective because your specific MR may or may not assist or harm a goal of ours, but we're really not gonna have an opinion on it as the RELBU. We look to our friends in engineering as they are trying to figure out how to make RELBU dreams come true as to whether this is on the path and right for REL or not. Now, a key difference as I mentioned is the only path to maintainership in CentOS Stream is through a Red Hat work contract, um, but SIGs are different. And so SIGs can be anything they want. My understanding is Neil is going to propose the Neil SIG where only code that is an acrostics that spells Neil will be accepted for merge. All other code will be rejected. That's fine if he can get it through the board. Like he can have whatever contribution that SIG can have whatever process they want. Now, the, the second problem that we, we wanted solved, and so CentOS Stream became part of that solution, was we wanted to create a place where you can get ready for the next rel release. And I won't talk about rel releases again, but I do want to touch briefly on get ready. And that is to prepare to do something. And in this case, the prepare to do something in our mind was, well, what do our customers do? Our customers need to get ready for the next rel. And the way you get ready for the next rel is you think about what that's going to be like underneath your application or your workload. And the way you do that is testing. And so to test, you need two things. You've got to have something that looks like what you're going to use. And Sysdos Stream, it's built on the rel sources. It, it checks that box handling. And you need something that's ready to test. That's composes and build artifacts. And most importantly, those artifacts have to be ready. They have to be functional. They have to be bug free. You can't test your SaaS service on code that has bugs in it that everybody knows are there. That like, uh, oops, I just forgot, you know, it's 5 p.m. on a Friday. Shouldn't have done that. This has to be ready to go. It has to be like the thing that you're testing towards, which is that next realm. And so we wanted to solve that problem. That was one of our goals. We want that space to exist. We believe it will provide value to the entire ecosystem and our customers as well as a part of that ecosystem. So how does that contrast with other things in the CentOS project? So let's talk about the hyperscale SIG. So the hyperscale SIG is great. I love the hyperscale SIG um, concept. Uh, I know a lot of the people in it personally. They're amazing people. But it's not actually a goal for the RELBU. It's a non-goal from our perspective. Um, they're coming together to do interesting things around code that meets a use case that isn't a direct RELBU goal these days. Now, code that comes out of that SIG may be amazingly right for RHEL. There may be, you know, I don't know, some DNF thing or whatever that somebody goes in and goes, oh, look, the SIG did this thing and it's, oh, wow. That was, you know, we didn't even know that edge case existed, but now we're going to lift this code and, hey, can you all help us contribute it into CentOS Stream? That's going to be amazing. But the SIG itself is, is not terribly interesting to us. And so what that means is that the RHEL BU is unlikely to do anything to cause Red Hat paid employees to show up on employee time to work in that SIG. Doesn't mean you won't see employees there. They're interested in it. Great. There may be other units of Red Hat that have different goals and objectives. That's great, too. The rel BU is terribly interested. But what we are terribly interested in, we are very interested in, is having the hypersale SIG have the opportunity for success. And so one of my goals is thinking about what are the challenges that that SIG may or may not be, fa may be facing. Not, may not, wouldn't be interesting. So may be facing that we should go solve that problem for them. And that challenge is obviously not going to be, we don't know how to build this particular piece of code for you know a cluster that has a gajillion machines in it, because that's not interesting to me. Um, but it might be, and again, I'm going to get a little of this wrong, and Johnny is not allowed to make fun of me in the chat. But my understanding is that we may have had a problem at one point where SIGs couldn't build a custom kernel and make it the default. I may have completely misunderstood the situation, but the words kernel was in there. And so as the rel BU, that's a problem because if a SIG can't do this, as I understand it, it, it's not terribly interesting what their outputs are in some cases. So we need to fix that. The fact that the SIG in question does something that is not an interesting thing for the rel BU doesn't mean we shouldn't fix this problem to enable success. 
And so I, I hope that that is fixed. If it is the actual definition of the problem, someone smart in the chat will tell us. Um, what this means is that the RELBU does have an interest in ensuring community health. But it's also interesting to note that we want the community healthy as a general concept. If you look at some other parts of Red Hat, they have much more specific goals in this area, goals that align well with us and, in fact, overshadow us. And I'm thinking in particular of the Open Source Program Office. They provide community architects the programs, specifically in part to help with community health. Now, for those of you who don't know, Rich Bowen is his internal title is community architect, and he is actually a community architect in the Open Source Program Office. Um, we actually used to be on the same team together many years ago. He's amazing at this job. I could not do this nearly as well as he does. Um, but that's what he thinks on in part in his day. And I don't want to try and claim that I know all of OSPO's goals, but I know that they overshadow us with their very specific goals and measurements around community health as an example. So given this kind of set of things that are happening in the project, given that I've told you what we're not able to use as a way to determine what Red Hat wants, and given that I want to get to questions and I promised you something specific, what does Red Hat want? I have given you six bullets. I will read them to you in poor presentation style. We would like to see you all build a solid community of contributors. We want to see participants. And, and I want to be clear, I'm not putting words like source code contributors on this slide on purpose. We want an active community. We want to see the project do cool things, even when they don't interest us. Hello, Hyperscale said. We want the community to be a positive influence on projects that are further upstream. Great relationship with Fedora? That'd be aces. I think we have it, but let's get it even better and closer. Huge influence on the way the Java community thinks about things. Like, I don't know, Java, it's one of the languages I've never been able to learn for some reason. We could talk about that in the chat later. Um, but like, that would be awesome too. We want you to help us create RHEL. Everybody knew this would be on the list. Not going to belabor the point. When my colleagues at Red Hat show up, we want you to treat them like every other community member. Look at their ideas. Think about it. In cases where the, the community is making the decision on the merge, like in a SIG, make that decision appropriately. Debate it. Let's work through this. They may or may not be acting on a BU priority. So do not assume that every person who happens to work for Red Hat shows up with their Red Hat on their head. And this last one, I, I think, is super critical. Um, it's not last for any reason other than the slides that I stole to make this presentation from my presentation at Nest already had the first five. So I just kind of left it because um, they're very similar for a reason. Um, but this last one is define your own success and goals and do them. Are there guardrails? Absolutely. But there's a whole lot of room here. There's room to follow your own path. There's room to do great things with OSPO and other parts of Red Hat. And there's rooms to convince me to prioritize the problems that you're facing. But have those success goals and, and understand why the project is succeeding or challenged based on your understanding. Don't look to Red Hat, or especially the RELBU, to tell you if the project is overall doing well or not. Because for us, the project doing well, as you can see from these other things, involves a lot of things that aren't necessarily in our area of focus, even if they may be personally interesting to me. So that, that goal of success, I think, is important. Um, unfortunately, at Hopin, I can't pass the mic, as I understand it. So please do put uh, questions. Let's have some comments and dialogue in the chat. Um, I'll also try and flip back to the chat, but I will not do a read back. Um, I think it would just drive me too crazy. Um, but I will read everything that was in the chat after the, the conversation here has petered out. And I will put these back up in case these can serve as inspiration for things that we should talk about uh, in detail. I, I'm going to echo what Rich has said in the very first line here, which is uh, or that I get to see. Um, I go so far as to say, especially when they don't interest Red Hat, yes, please. Like, we really do want to see lots of cool ideas here. 
um, because your cool ideas may become things that interest us and we'll show up to the party. Your cool ideas may just be cool and cool is awesome. The Q&A tab tells me that you, yes, you should be the first to ask a question. Well, I don't want to let the awkward silence stretch out forever, um, but uh, please do ask questions. Um, if you don't have any, we will take a break before the next session, but I'll give it a minute or two more. Uh, for those of you who plan to write into various publications about my presentation style, do know that this event has a fixed time limit without regards to how long you wish to speak. So. You got what you got. All right. In the absence of hearing any questions, uh, thank you, Bex, for this presentation. And uh, thank you all for attending. Our next session, which will be in 30 minutes, will be Troy Dawson talking about the state of Apple on CentOS. And of course, those of you who have used CentOS for a while know how important Apple is, and I expect this to be a very interesting presentation. Thank you again, Bex. And we will resume in 30 minutes. There are some of us hanging out over in the hallway track if you want to just ask questions and hang out and socialize. <laughs>